Hi everyone, this is Elias Martin of CollectingJapanesePrints.com. Welcome to my latest seminar, Facing Modernity, Sosaku Hanga Portraits of Women. I, I typically do these lectures or so seminars uh, twice a year in commemoration of Asia Week, which is uh, has started right now in New York. Um, I'm not traveling to York, New York to the openings or the auctions this year. I'll probably do that next time. But instead, I thought, well, why not uh, present a, a, um, a talk on one of my favorite topics, uh, meaning Sosaku Hanga prints. Uh, and um, before we get into the, the lecture, um, there's going to be a lot of material that will be covered. I will be uh, showcasing the prints in person in terms of them being here with me. And so I'll be able to zoom in on each work. For those of you who have never attended my lectures or my Woodblock Wednesday uh, vlogs, welcome. This is something I do weekly on Woodblock Wednesday and all of my previous videos, including my previous seminars, are on my website, collectingjapaneseprints.com. You could either go into the events section uh, and you could access the, the previous seminars or the Woodblock Wednesday section, which will give you an archive of nearly 100 videos. Next, this coming week, we will celebrate our 100th uh, video of Woodblock Wednesday. So I'm kind of excited about that and, and I have a really good group of prints to show all, all of you. Um, but today, I want to present to you a, a, a collection of uh, 20th century Sosaku Hanga portraits by um, a variety of artists that were very important in Japan. Um, and what I've tried to do is showcase some of the most notable or, or in some cases, some of the rarest designs. So for many of you, a lot of these designs will be new, which is great. Um, I'm, it's a pleasure to be able to make this introduction to, to these uh, designs as well as these artists. And um, so I, I suppose we should, before we get into looking at the artwork, we should discuss you know, what Sosaku Hanga is. And what I, I, the way that I'll do, do it that, is that I'll, I'll, describe it, I'll describe what it's not. Um, most um, people who come um, in contact with 20th century Japanese prints are familiar with Shinhanga designs. And Shinhanga prints are basically a continuation of the traditional Edo period um, style of woodblock printmaking, meaning that a publisher has hired a artist to produce a design and the artist has of course produced it and the publisher has sort of reviewed the design and approved it for production and um, has given the design to his um, uh, artisans um, to carve, uh, carve the blocks and print the prints. So the publisher really finances the entire operation. And so it's very important that the artist produce work that would meet his uh, or her criteria. Publishers during the Edo period were all male, so I'll just use the pronoun he. And the, these, uh, these publishers um, you know, were very interested in, in kabuki uh, plays as well as what was fashionable with kimonos. They were hired by tea houses as well as um, textile companies or, or department stores to promote particular kimonos um, or, or geisha or a variety of reasons uh, prints were produced. Uh, but the, the main element uh, in their production was it was a commercial uh, venture. And so for artists, th though they were producing designs that they were very interested in, in doing, they had to meet criteria that pleased the publisher. And not just that, there was also um, issues with censorship. And Edo period Japan, there was quite a bit of censorship. And so artists had to produce designs that both met the publisher's standards and, and criteria as well as the the government's sort of um, criteria. 
And moving into the 20th century, uh, those things sort of carried on. Uh, Watanabe was one of those uh, publishers who, he was the first who started Shinhanga, and he started uh, producing prints in earnest in this tradition. Now, Sosaku Hanga artists were completely different. Um, though they're working in a tradition that is centuries old and certainly something very important to the Japanese culture and history, the artists approached printmaking very differently. So they, they were influenced by Western artists, Western ideas of what art is. In fact, Prior to the Meiji period, the idea of an artist was something that was very foreign. Um, the, the idea of artisan was pretty much what people sort of interacted with, and, and, and that made more sense. But an individual with something to say artistically was not something that was encouraged or promoted. So Sakuhanga artists, uh, particularly the, the first group of pioneers, um, Yamamoto, Kanai, for example, was one of the artists that believed in being able to express themselves in this particular print um, medium, um, but not be not be determined by other factors, um, sort of the 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 commercial issues, well, the publisher, as well as other things, and, and they were really interested in sort of showcasing their individuality, their feelings, their perspective on, on art and in history. And a subgenre in Sosaku Hanga has been Bijinga, just like Edo period and just like in Shinhanga. It, it was a tradition of portraiture that's gone back centuries. And the Sosaku Hanga artists certainly employed this, this uh, motif in their work. But they used it differently, and, um, and I, I find it very fascinating in how they explored this, this subject. Um, and what I've done is I tried to highlight some, some differences in, 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 in how artists produce this motif, and how, you know, how it reflects the dialogue of the time, and how forward-thinking they were. Um, and also, at the same time, um, for all of us who are familiar with Shinhanga prints, maybe we can have in our mind the ideas or these, uh, th these images that we, we've come across. Prints by Goyo, prints by Katando, prints by Shinsui. And as we're looking through these designs, we could sort of mentally compare it and see how stark the, the contrast is the, the there in some in some cases some of these designs aren't even recognizable as Jap as Japanese motifs um, some portraits look very Western very European and and so that that's very much part of the uh, that re that reflects the interest of the artist in international con concerns and international artistic ideas that were being sort of distributed across the world through publications and magazines and movies and books. And so you know, the Japanese artists were very much uh, interested in, in that. And, and so anyway, we'll, we'll go into those particulars when we you know, discuss each work. But I just sort of wanted to sort of paint the, the whole movement with a wide brush. Um, and so again, these artists are all artists that are either self-taught or worked, uh, studied under another artist or a university, but then went on onto the, with them on their own and produced artwork. And, and in, in this case, most of these artists had a very limited uh, clientele, a very limited audience. They did produce work that would, could be sold, but by and large, most of the things we'll be seeing are extraordinarily rare. And they were produced in very scarce um, amounts of, of impressions. So Shinhanga prints were produced by the hundreds, in some cases thousands. Um, but in these prints, they, in some cases, they're unique or they number in, in a dozen or so. And so it's amazing that some of these have survived and I'm very fortunate to be able to present this group uh, to all of you.
Um, and before we, we dive into the artwork, I just want to welcome all of you who are watching live and also who are, will be watching this video on YouTube. Um, as some of you know, all of my Woodblock uh, Wednesday videos, as well as these seminars, are uploaded or onto YouTube where you can access them at your convenience. So, you know, I just want to welcome everyone. Um, this video might be watched by someone, who knows, 10 years from now. So it's 2022 uh, and we are in the spring of 2022 in March celebrating uh, Asia Week. Um, and so I want to welcome all of you. So without further ado, let's have a look at the table. So I want to start with basically the very first Sosaku Hanga artist. But I want to back up a little bit and I want to sort of showcase a couple things um, so we can have a, a, a common reference point. This is one of the most famous designs by the artist Utamaro. Oh, and I will also want to say that in the comments of this video, whether on Facebook or on YouTube, I will look, put a listing of all of the artists that we discussed with their dates and the spelling of their names. So if you're interested in looking these artists up and learning more, all of that information will be there. So not to worry. So, you know, you don't have to, you know, write down all these names as we're, we're saying them. They will be provided uh, later. So this artist uh, was uh, an Edo period artist working in the mid to late 1700s. And Utamaro is celebrated for creating sort of the ideal of the Japanese feminine um, um, print that, I mean, just celebrates everything that is um, um, feminine with with these designs and so th this this uh, beautiful work shows a very delicate um, design of a, a cafe wa waitress um, uh, and uh, it's a very famous portrait and she's holding a fan with a beautiful kimono um, and sh she's actually wearing a few kimonos that are very fashionable uh, of the time and the background has a, a beautiful application of silver mica and so this is sort of, this became the ideal for bijinga or images of beautiful women in Japan. And, and most artists that came after Utamaro, I would, I would argue every single artist that did a, a, a image of a beautiful woman looked back to Utamaro for inspiration. And many referenced his prints. Um, they, they were very popular and his prints are found throughout the world in, in all kinds of museums and, and institutions. And so this is the foundation of the tradition. And that I just want to sh quickly show an example. This is just one print that I, I just pulled at random from my website. Um, and this is a, a print by Katundo, Tori Katundo. And this is a continuation of this, the tr oops, the tradition that uh, started with Utamaro. And so what we see here is, again, an image of a beautiful woman. And Katando uh, shows her lost in, in thought as, as she's tiling off. And it, it, it's beautiful, it's delicate, serene, picturesque. Um, it is everything one uh, sort of thinks about in terms of 20, 20th century Shinhanga beauty designs. Here, I'm gonna see if I can angle this so that the glare off the, the light uh, isn't troublesome. And so, you know, I wanted, I mean, it's a beautiful design and I wanted to show the continuation of that tradition. And, okay, so now that we've seen that, I'm gonna show you things that look very, very different from, from the, the the 20th century Shinhanga movement, um, and and we'll we'll discuss why. But in this particular design, this is a work by Yamamoto Kanai, and it's it's a design he created on a trip to Europe, and he funded his trip by a subscription service, and so he had a a a, a nice sized clientele that agreed to buy his prints. 
and basically fronted him the money so that he could take the trip. And this is one of the first prints he produced. This is from 1913, and his ship uh, that took off from, might have been Kobe, but it, it left Japan and stopped in China. And this is a scene in China. Uh, it depicts uh, three uh, women who, are, who happen to be prostitutes. And what we also see is he depicts them as he encountered them. They, they ha happen to have the, the so-called lily foot or their feet have been bound. Uh, and it was a torture, a torturous tradition um, in, in China that ba basically was still, uh, it was dying out. But it, when Yamamoto traveled to China, he, he did encounter women um, with their feet bound. And, you know, he depicts them in almost in a, in a Toulouse-Lautrec kind of way. Um, they're, they're a caricature of sorts. Their, their faces don't necessarily look realistic. And, and the whole scene is actually kind of dark um, and foreboding. And so I think it's interesting because Yamamoto Kanai is very familiar with the tradition of Bijinga, or images of beautiful women. And quite frankly, many people would have asked him, why waste the paper if you're not producing, you know, Bijinga? And one might argue, well, this is this is not Bijinga, but I kind of see it, it that it is. Um, it's just his version of it because it's it's based in in a certain kind of realism. Um, and, and, and it's also based in, in what he experienced. And, and this design really reflects his state of mind and his feelings. And I think for Yamamoto's work, it's very important to see that. He was one of the first artists. I mean, he was arguably the first artist to produce the first Sosaku Hanga print. And this journey to Europe uh, showcases some of the earliest work produced that um, that highlights this newfound sense of individualism. And um, again, you know, looking at the print itself, it's very expressive. The way it's carved and printed is very expressive. And Yamamoto, I should mention, was a skilled woodblock carver. He apprenticed and was able to carve anything in in, in in astonishing realism. There are some designs he created that are highly realistic, but in this design, he, he did not want to take that avenue. He really wanted to show a, a very impressionistic um, experience that he had. And, and as I said, it, it, it's kind of like um, a Toulouse-Lautrec inspired work. It's very um, gritty and, and dark and, and the light source uh, is is not clean, and you can, it creates all these shadows, and there's a kind of a smoky uh, quality to it, but it's also really powerful. And I, I love this design. It's a fantastic design that's looking beyond the shores of Japan for inspiration, and clearly showcasing the direct experience of the artist um, while he was on a voyage. And for those connoisseurs, I want to I want to show this print is mounted onto a Western style mat. Um, this paper is actually something he probably acquired in Paris, and he carved and print the work, and he also signed it here in the mat. And so this is an example of something he 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 probably sketched this on his way to Paris and then produced the print while he was in Paris. So the design was sketched and then produced in Europe and then shipped back to Japan while he was abroad. And so it's amazing to know that this work, uh, particularly with its folder, has survived so long. Um, and again, this work uh, is about 1912, so it's very early. Now, I have a lot of artwork to show, and for those of you who have joined me in the past, you know that um, I, I try to show a lot of work, and so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to go a little bit faster than, than what I've done in order to get everything in. This is another work by Yamamoto, uh, and this was done 1912, and this showcases a woman who's standing um, 
on a on a ship and then the water is reflecting um, the light off the water is reflecting this really interesting uh, pattern and so this design although not necessarily a bijinga traditionally we don't see the woman's face it's just her sort of silhouette her form and then just her pigtail nonetheless it's still a subject of a of a woman and it's very early and it showcases again the artist's direct experience and highlights a, a, a beautiful memory that he had on a trip and it also he's taken a, um, this opportunity to showcase also his skill in carving the block and producing this effect that is very modern and it showcases the actual process and making the 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 prints he he gouged out the block and impressed that pattern onto the the print so he's not hiding the ball at all he's really showing the the materials used in pr the production of this print something that was never done before i mean you, one can argue that the prints of hiroshige and hokusai that highlighted the wood grain um, did have that aspect, and I, I, I understand that, I would agree, but here we have the artist directly carving a block that showcases the process of making the print, um, and again, that's, that's very uh, modern, very forward-looking in terms of adding um, an essence of individuality and, and a personal expression. So, you know, I would wanted to highlight this print because it's, it's, it's a very important design because of how the artist carved the blocks. Now, um, this is from 1913, and one can argue that this might be one of the first, if not the first, Sosakuhanga nude. Um, and it showcases bathers at, in Brittany, a northern part of France. And, um, you know, it's done in the very kind of soft color palette. And he's printed it with a, a, a real interest in, in, the, in the shapes of the rocks. They're, they're not abstracted, but they're, they're, they're kind of loose. And he's also not um, focused too closely on the, the figures. They're, they're very simplified. And as I mentioned, um, Yamamoto was very skilled at woodblock carving. And so he could have easily reproduced this image with astonishing detail but chose to create something more with an impressionistic quality. When I look at the, this design, I think of Cezanne's uh, bathers. They, it has a very strong kind of connection to Cezanne and other Western artists that were working in simplifying the human form in painting. And the irony in that is that they were influenced by Japanese prints of the Edo period. And so what we see here is like the winds of influence have have come back to Japan. Um, and so this is one example of, of, of how Yamamoto is sort of looking at the work of Cezanne and Manet in this simplified um, form, um, you know, celebrating the nude, but not necessarily in a very specific way. The other thing I'll point out before we go is that in Japanese prints, the motif of, of bathers is, is as old as, as prints themselves. And we, we see prints by a variety of different artists showcasing people in a hot uh, spa. And they're, they're sort of bathing or sitting and relaxing. And, and so this motif is nothing new. But in those designs, there's a lot of care and attention that's been placed on creating the figure to look aesthetically beautiful and delicate. And here, Yamamoto is more interested in, in getting the feeling of the, of the scene and invoking the, the artistic trends that he was encountering when he was in Europe. And again, this work was done in 1913. All right, that's a lot to see. So I'm going to keep moving. And of course, um, I, 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 I love seeing people. Uh, I see that there's several people now logged in and, and watching the presentation. Welcome all of you. If any of you have any questions, feel free to uh, you know, chime in and I'd be happy to address your questions. So this work is by another very important 
20th century Japanese printmaker. His name is Onchi, uh, Onchi Koshiro. And this work um, dates back to about uh, 1919, 1920. Uh, and it, it showcases the same motif that we just looked at, bathers. And this print, like Yamamoto's print, was entirely produced by Onchi. He carved the blocks, he printed the print. Um, and I'm going to keep saying that. By and large, every single artist we discuss, with a couple exceptions, carved the, the blocks and printed the prints themselves. And in this design, what we see is a celebration of the, of the form, a female form in a very simple but elegant way where the colors are advancing sort of the, the feel of the composition. You know, Onchi was an amazing artist, um, I think arguably the best 20th century printmaker. And he was credited with producing the first work of abstraction in 1915 that was before this print. So a few years before, this is 1919, 1920. So considering that he was interested in abstraction, um, as an artist, he was really interested in conveying emotion and, and, and the artist's own feeling for the subject as opposed to realism. And so in this case, um, Yamamoto, Yamamoto, who we just discussed, and Onchi are, I think, looking at the same influence. They're looking at Cezanne. Here, I'm going to bring back the one print. So you could just, it's a nice thing to compare since we have them here in, in person. You know, that's why I like doing these presentations because a lot of times when you go to a, you go to a lecture, it's all, you know, you're just looking at slides. And here we're looking at the real, the real McCoy. These are the prints and we can compare them side by side and, and, and examine the printing. You could kind of see the detail there. So it's very similar in the sense that that the form that they've elected to present to the viewer is um, simplified. But at the same time, I think they both have done a really good job uh, of, of sort of bringing an image to the viewer that is full of the, uh, of, of the artist's own emotional sort of experience. So it's not so much about the scene more than the artist and what the artist was feeling at the time which is radical. In Japanese prints, in Japanese art history, these ideas were quite new. And so th these works really reflect um, the novelty of, this, uh, of, of these ideas. And, 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 and I, 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 I would argue that they also are quite important because of it. Now, the next work by Onchi um, is, is a, a nude, very much part of the motif of Bijinga that you would, uh, you know, Utamaro did many designs of, of women um, emerging from a, a, a bath or at the spa, and then all the other artists follow suit. And Onchi, in this design, does something interesting. You know, of course, he pays uh, attention to the female form and, and, and presents a beautiful woman, but her hair is sort of covering her face. And the in Japanese uh, prints, the face is one of the most important aspects of the design. I mean, if one can imagine a Katundo or a Utamaro with, with, or Shinsui, I mean, there are certain designs where the artist has obscured the face with the hair being playful. But generally speaking, y you see the face. And in, in this case, the... Uh, Onchi covers the face, almost saying it's not about the woman's face. And it's really not about the woman's figure, although he pr presents a very well-articulated figure. He, he's expressing his contention that it's about the emotional connection of the experience of this image. And so how, how did Onchi present this image to the viewer? How are we responding to it? And, and, and what we see here is an interesting idea where the surface of the paper and the way that it's printed is an active agent in the, the, in the, in the work. Pre, prior to uh, Sosaku Hanga, 
there was a certain amount of um, attention that was given to textiles. And so very fine prints were produced uh, showcasing um, you know, the most fashionable textiles of the time and the kimonos that, 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 that were on the most fashionable women. And, and those textiles and the way that those prints were produced did create an interesting sort of surface to the prints. And they also, you know, Utamaros had a mica application in the background in some of those designs. So the idea of surface was something that artists and publishers were concerned with. But Onchi takes it a step further. And the surface of the, of the paper, the way that the pigment has sort of bled through into the, the, the design and has, you know, there's this really wonderful uh, spontaneous and wet quality to the printing. And it almost looks as if he, the artist just printed it moments uh, ago. And that's what he wanted to c capture. And it's that wetness that also connects the, the design with the woman emerging out of the bath as well. And, but it's also this, this, this wetness or this, this kind of wet-like printing technique that Onchi um, sort of invented. He went on to reproduce it in different formats and different subjects. So it's not something he just used in this design. And it's not just associated with a woman coming out of the bath. But in this case, it's one of the earliest examples of the technique. And it really highlights the artist's interest in producing work that was beyond what was understood as it was just a graphically beautiful design. There's an emotional dimension to this impression based on the printing itself that is, is new, much new, it really new, along with his other earlier work. And of course, Yamamoto Kanai as well, but in this case in particular, that emotional sort of power is here. And I just think it's great. The other thing that uh, I'd like to point out is that this work is signed by the artist in a, in a Western format. This is not a traditional way of signing in Japan. And it's a very early work. And so this shows Onchi's interest of, of producing artwork that made uh, connections beyond Japan's shores and was thinking about the the artist community around the world and art collectors and art connoisseurs that were well beyond, um, you know, found in Japan. The, the, the other thing I want to point out, um, uh, let me see if I could, uh, I'll, I'll save that for, for another print, but, you know, just again, I, I do want to highlight just the way that it's, it's the, the production of the piece how how wonderfully um, emotionally um, potent this design is. Now I'm going to zoom in so you could see. All right, let me. Let me move on to the next folder. Wow, 30 minutes have gone by. I have, I'm going to have to move a little bit faster. But it, it was important to cover that design because uh, it, it really discusses, you know, Onchi's uh, technique. And so this design uh, was done in 1929, also by Onchi. And it showcases a, a bit more of a traditional uh, subject in a sense that now we see the woman's face and her body. But in, in traditional bijinga that had nudes, they were always sort of partially nude. Um, of course, the 20th century designs like Katundo and Shinsui, they highlighted nudes as well. But they were always in a location where you would find a nude, like in a bathroom or in, at, the, um, at the hot uh, springs. But in this case, we have a nude of a woman that's sort of reclining. And she's on a white cloth and, and not really caring. Um, and, and so in this case, it's a little bit more radical. The subject uh, is not necessarily concerned about her nudity. And the artist presents 
her body pretty much, um, you know, without any obstacle uh, covering or uh, the, the, the design. So, you know, she's very much showcased um, in this position. And um, what, what's interesting, though, is that this design is known in a lot of different states. Um, they all have a beautiful mica application in the background. But in this impression, we sort of see the, this purple that's around the, the figure, um, sort of creating the outline of the, the woman's form. And the purple and bluish cues kind of read, I, I think they're particularly interesting and I love it. But, you know, I, could, I can imagine some people being sort of put off by the color because it almost looks like bruising or, or the color of a corpse. And these are sort of criticism, criticisms you would see on some paintings that uh, Europeans were producing. And so some of the work of Manet has that sort of effect. And Egon Shelley also produced work that has that effect. And so Onchi was really um, sort of interested in producing work that was fascinating, that was beautiful, but also thought um, provoking. And, and, and he was interested in a wider conversation than just uh, Japanese prints. So I'm going to zoom in so you could see. For many of you looking at this print for the first time, you might be surprised to know that it's by a Japanese artist because it looks uh, it looks European um, and it also looks it's very advanced um, looking in, in in the way that it's produced. So, all right, we're going to move on. Now, this work is by Yumeji. Wow. And uh, Yumeji Takahisa, now he wasn't a Sosaku Hanga artist per se, but I included him in this conversation um, because he helped Onchi and several other artists sort of come to their own and be, and, and, and be more confident. They were sort of in his circle in the late teens and early 20s. And so uh, Yumeji also was one of those artists that was highly independent and he started his own um, sort of shop. He, he sold uh, his prints, he, sold, he created stationery and, and textiles with his designs and his, his, it was a studio um, and also sort of um, gallery um, shop and, and Onchi and other artists were congregate um, at the shop and discuss certain artistic ideas. And this design is fantastic. It's from the late, thir early 30s. I think it's 1931, 32. I need to look that up. But uh, this is an exhibition poster for Yumeji's uh, show at, um, at a department store. And what I find really fascinating is that Onchi, here, I'll, I'll show this print one more time because I think they, 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 they relate to each other. Onchi was the student of Yumeji in some regard. He, Yumeji encouraged Onchi to produce artwork, and it, it was actually Yumeji that introduced Onchi to his publisher, or one of the publishers that produced Onchi's Sukuhai, or his Moon Glow magazine that highlighted his prints um, as, well as, as well as his art school uh, associates, Fujimori and Tanaka. And so they came together and created this uh, literary um, magazine featuring prints. And um, it was Yumeji that encouraged him to do it. And Yumeji pushed uh, Onchi to experiment. And it was in one of those magazines that actually Onchi produced the first work of abstraction. So in many regards, Yumeji was Onchi's uh, teacher. However, in this case, I think it's interesting because this design is from 1929, and this is from 1931-32, and I, I see a similarity, you know, and, and though this is a vertical work, you know, you, you could kind of look at it this way, and I see, I see a woman 
the, this similar figure is is here as well. She's more simplified in, in this format. And, and, and of course, it, she looks like a Yumeji girl. I mean, for those of you familiar with Yumeji, uh, he has a very distinct style that looks like, um, uh, you know, a, a Yumeji woman. And I just wanted to highlight how similar they are. Now, I'm going to step back and also discuss one other thing. Um, and uh, I'm just looking at the comments and you're reading my mind because these two designs showcase the same type of woman, a moga. And a moga was a woman who cut her hair and moved into the city, Tokyo. And this was the, it, within the time of the mid to late 20s and early 30s. Um, and so a moga was sort of a liberated, independent woman. Um, Tokyo was booming as a city and, and was able to provide jobs for women um, for the first time. And at this time, by the way, it was almost taboo to cut your hair short. And Onchi showcases a woman completely nude in a very modern hairstyle. You know, and in, in many ways, the, the, the female form becomes a platform to showcase Japan's modernity. And I think that's a, a very important point. It's really fascinating to consider. And in this poster, we, we see that yet again. The, the poster celebrates not just Yumeji's exhibition, but also the, the, there's a certain aspect of the poster looking very contemporary or modern. And of course, that, that is about the woman's hair, the woman's pose, the, 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 the stark nudity. It's almost in the, there's this confident, independent quality in, in both of these designs. All right, I'm going to keep going and I'm going to go fast because a lot to see. I keep saying I want to go fast, and, and, but there, every, every work does require a little bit of uh, explanation. So these two works um, are by Yamagishi. And Yamagishi um, was a woodblock carver. He worked with most of the Sosaku Hanga artists. I mean, I'm sorry, Shin Hanga artists, take that back. And so he worked with Toraji and other artists to carve the blocks um, for, for the prints. So the publishers were quite well, uh, the publishers sought, off, uh, sought out for um, um, a sort of a partnership with Yamagishi. And, um, but because he was a skilled woodblock carver, he was able to carve and print his own designs as well. And so he's one of those artists that sort of straddled both of those worlds. He's not necessarily Sosaku Hanga's per, Sosaku Hanga artist per se, but he did produce uh, produce independent artwork of his own that showcased his own ideas um, for their own purposes. And in the mid to late twenties, I think he, he left Japan in 1926. And he took a trip to Europe and to the United States. And these two prints were produced when he was in California. And he was actually teaching um, the production of woodblock prints. He, he was teaching how to carve woodblocks and how to print them. And the, this design was produced in California uh, during his time there. Uh, he returned to Japan, I think, about 1929. So what we have here is a Western woman. Um, in this short hairstyle of the late 20s. And if she was Japanese, this would be more of a moga style, but she happens to be Western. And she's reclining, uh, she has her hand sort of holding her up and sort of sitting down, um, partially nude. And she's looking at a woodblock print. And this design is actually a design of Mount Fuji that Yamagishi produced. So it's a very clever print within a print and so I just want to zoom in so you could kind of see the quality of the production of the of the print and so I just want to highlight this because there were some artists like Yamagishi that that and, and Yumeji that weren't necessarily Sosaku Hanga artists per se but they were producing highly individualistic work 
that advance their own ideas as artists. And, and this, this set of two, one is a variant of the, of the other, is very rare. He only produced a handful of these designs, and, and he may have taken some to Japan, but a few were sold in the U.S., and that was that. So this is a really wonderful example of his work that was done, carved, and printed by him. All right, next work is another design by Onchi. This is from 1931, and there's various versions of this print. Um, there's different states. There's one that's unique that is a diptych. There, there's, a, there's a lower portion with water in a, um, that's, that's sort of stylized. But um, in this case, this is one of the later versions where he, he cut the design in half, and um, and sort of wanted to focus more on the figure in midair. It's a fantastic design. It it is of a diver. We see a portion of the diving board. It quite frankly it makes more sense this way because if she's diving off a diving board, the water that's represented at the bottom looks more like the ocean than than a pool of water. And so this design makes a little bit more sense in that way and i wanted to highlight this work not just because it's by onchi and it's such a stunning design you know onchi was fantastic at producing graphically compelling compelling compositions i mean he was a master at being able to do that in concert with amazing uh, ability to print um, impressions but the other aspect of this print that I think is important is that it does show a moga of sorts. This is a modern woman in the early part of the 30s because in Japan, the, the idea of a, a modern woman well, went well beyond just you know being in the city. Uh, she was also very active and, 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 and was healthy. And, and so the, there were a lot of artists that were hired to produce posters of women that were, that were sort of swimming or doing very active um, leisurely pursuits that sort of almost encouraged women to do things, but it also highlighted what the, the idea or the ideal um, conception of what a modern woman was. So in many ways, this is the idealized form of a woman who is active and independent and she's soaring in the sky as she's diving um, towards, a, uh, towards a, a pool of water. And so it's, it's beyond just a beautiful design and composition, but it's also um, in, in step with something that was a, a greater movement um, in in the depiction of women, particularly mogas. Now quickly, the motif of a woman getting ready for the, her day is not something new to Sosaku Hanga artists. In fact, you know, as I may have mentioned, and if not, I'm mentioning it now, this is a motif that goes back to well before Utamaro's time. And every artist, I think, who, who produced um, images of, of, of beautiful women produced something similar in the sense of a woman preparing um, herself uh, to go out for a day. And here, Onchi produced this design. And I think Onchi's composition is really interesting because it's different. And it, again, we have an element that is obscuring the the face of the the woman we we saw in one of his earlier works from from 1929 where the woman's face is completely obscured in this design it's it's only partially obscured by her own arm as it, the way that i read this and i think this would be helpful this is the mirror here the woman is actually right here behind the screen we only see her her arm and the mirror reflects the comp well the her her form, but the composition is really focused on the interplay of the of the screen that obscures the the woman and then her partial reflection. 
So the, the, the design is really wonderful. It's very strong. There's a beautiful aspect to the printing. Um, it's very, it's delicate. And at the same time, there's a lot of emotion and a lot of expressiveness in the printing. In this impression, the, the screen has this really wonderful embellishments of white and it's overprinted a, um, onto a gray. In other impressions, this section is usually just white. So this gives a really wonderful sense of texture to the screen uh, door. And, um, and then, of course, the composition of, of, of the woman's reflection is so wonderful. And Onchi's a master just being able to give you just enough in order to, to make a masterful um, scene. And here we have his wet like uh, style printing in the mirror that sort of bleeds into the woman's arm and that's very onchi esque and you know it's funny because th this is this design has a very playful quality to it uh, i i personally believe that the 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 handle here for the 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 screen kind of also echoes the woman's nipple that onchi strategically uh, shows in this composition. There's this, it's a very playful uh, kind of composition. And I want to highlight another version of this print done in a different color. Um, this here, this, the screen is, is done with a wider application. There's no gray under, uh, underneath. Although it is, I don't know if this is intentional or just how the pigment is starting to sort of tarnish, but it actually gives a sense of depth to the composition. So it may have been added intentionally by the artist and then printed over. Uh, and then of course, in the background here, there's a silver application over the gray. It's signed in pencil and Western script. So these two are variants uh, from the more known version where it's this Pepto-Bismol pink and a white, solid white uh, format for the, the screen. But I just wanted to, to highlight these because they're very playful and they show, of course, this woman who's a very modern woman with her MOGA haircut. It's this kind of flapper-esque uh, style that women would wear in this time. And um, it's just showcasing her getting ready for her day. I'm just quickly glancing at the comments. Thank you for everyone uh, participating. Uh, yes, um, and if you have any questions, feel free to just jump right into the conversation and I'll address them as I see them um, populate. So the continuing on the conversation of MOGAs, I'm gonna show these really rare works by uh, the Sasakuhanga artist Yamaguchi Gen. And uh, Yamaguchi is actually known as a abstract artist. And he basically, you know, after, well, I would say maybe the, the last representational work that I can think of is in the late 30s. So about 1940 and on, he worked in abstraction um, in earnest. And so here, uh, these designs were done in the late 20s, early 30s, and they showcase uh, again, a MOGA or modern women doing all sor sorts of modern, modern things. So, for example, we have a woman here enjoying a cocktail. Uh, and then uh, we have a woman here smoking. A woman uh, applying makeup. Here she's playing cards. And this one, she's applying perfume. And this last one, she's just uh, admiring a, a flower. And all of these designs are, first of all, these are really rare. I mean, I, I, I've only, I'm only aware of a, of a couple of impressions of these uh, out in the world. And so they're extraordinarily rare, but they highlight uh, just sort of this interest in modernity in terms of, of what, was, what was happening in the culture. And they're all using, it's interesting, the, the female form as a way to sort of convey the modernity of the times. And so once again, uh, the important point that a woman's body or her form was a way to convey 
advancements in culture and, and in some cases also technology. So I'm, I'm going to zoom in so you can look at these one last time and we'll move on because we are we've hit the hour mark and uh, I don't want to keep you guys here forever, but I definitely want to showcase the rest of the group that I have. This, this smaller work is a woodblock print, and it's also an advertisement for Shiseido, the cosmetics company, and, and this was done in about 1930-31, and again, we have uh, a MOGA, very fashionable woman, in this, in, here she's in a kimono, but here she's in a western dress with a hat, and then we have cars from the late 20s, early 30s, and so... Um, the cars obviously are a connection to the technology of Japan being very much um, a an innovator and caught in the in the current time, and so showcasing to the world that they have what everyone has, and the women are very much doing the same thing with their fashion as the cars are doing in the composition. All right, well, the next work is by Hazama, and this showcases a Western woman dressed in a very fashionable attire of the time. And Hazama was the only Japanese artist that worked with um, the French artist Henri Matisse. And Matisse and Hazama knew each other for, for a bit. Hazama was in France for a couple years and worked under Matisse for a few months. And so in this design, um, this is a woman of, of, of the southern France um, where Matisse was located when, when um, Hazama um, traveled and to meet Matisse. And um, just I think Matisse's studio and home was just outside of Nice or within the Nice, within Nice's sort of, um, um, I, 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 I actually have been there. I believe it is in Nice. And um, I mean, it's, it, it was a beautiful uh, studio and home. And Hazama traveled there, met with a lot of artists, worked under Matisse. And in this design, we see not just a, the, uh, a woman from that area, also the coloration that the Hazama elected to use is sort of a nod towards Matisse. The bright yellows and reds are very Matisse-like. So I'm going to come in and zoom in so you could see. Now, this was produced um, for, for production and, and sale in Japan, um, and I believe this was made in Japan, not necessarily shipped to Japan from Europe um, uh, like Yamamoto's work. I think this was done in, in, in Japan, but it was done from his work that was directly associated with Matisse. All right. Moving right along. Let's, let me see if I can use my other hand. I'm starting to, my hand is starting to get tired from holding the phone. Okay, a few more mogas. So this, here, let me move this over. So this print is from 1933. It's by the Susaku Hanga artist Koizumi. Uh, Koizumi Kisho, and so we have a woman dressed very fashionably with her pillbox hat, a beautiful uh, dress with with this uh, this overcoat. I mean, very very fashionable Western um, in format. And again, a design like this showcases Japan's international sort of flair and being able to do two different things. The woodblock print, of course, is very traditional. But the, the subject is very contemporary for Koizumi. And Koizumi was really interested in showcasing Japan's sort of urban culture and, and modernism. And so this design really is very much caught in that conversation. Now, 
in this work here is from uh, Koizumi's um, uh, series of 100 um, new views of, of, of uh, Japan or Tokyo, actually. And um, this was done in 1937. And um, his work in this series is, is an attempt to highlight all of these wonderful aspects of, of, of Tokyo and, and, and Japan. And it really highlights the modernism uh, that Japan had. Um, and in many cases, new, it was newly acquired. And in other cases, it's been there since uh, the reconstruction of Tokyo after the earthquake. Um, and so Koizumi was really trying to showcase all of the technology and all of the views that you know made um, Japan, particularly Tokyo, an international uh, city, a city that is as good as any Western city. And in, in, in this design, we have these uh, women that are in a train car. Um, this is basically a subway. And what we have here is the platform um, and the lights, and the women are sort of sitting there quietly as they do even now, one never speaks in, a, in inside a Tokyo train. <laughs> and so they're just sort of looking caught in their own thought. And, um, and But it's, it's fascinating. We have here the handles for the uh, subway. And they're all sort of moving to the, the right. So you could tell that the, the train is moving. And it's about to pull into the station the way that they're, these, these handles are sort of angled. So it's a very active um, design although they're they're sort of quiet and and just uh sort of looking out um in thought but this is such a, a interesting design because it it's a conversation very much caught up in the current technology that japan definitely had and and it showcases this this idea of of the female form as as a way to sort of promote the japan's modernity Oh, well, this is uh, another moga. Uh, and I think this might be the last one of the mogas. Uh, this is by Nakagawa, Isaku Nakagawa. And this is one of his most um, famous prints. He, uh, it's called the Grand Masse, which is uh, named after the trick shot this uh, moga is about attempting to do. And so Nakagawa was an Osaka artist. He was based in Kansai and did not produce that many designs. He may have done maybe two dozen or so. Uh, and then he became kind of interested in ceramics and, and, and actually became quite famous as a ceramic artist. Nakagawa also traveled to California and was a, a professor of art and of, of woodblock printmaking. He received the key to the city of San Francisco, in fact. So he was very well loved and was uh, a figure that uh, was very prominent in the art world uh, there. But his longing um, for ceramic um, work brought him back to Japan. And so this is a work done in, uh, I believe, 1929, 1930, 31, uh, no later than 31. Um, and this is produced before his travels to the U.S., and um, this design is just a fantastic um, celebration of modernity. And, and again, um, one can read this in various ways. I mean, of course, one can read this as a delightful design of a modern girl in a very fashionable dress playing um, a Western um, game. But the other way of reading it is, is it's not just a woman playing, but it's Japan itself uh, playing this game in a very modern way and so it's highlighting to the world uh, how modern Japan is and how cosmopolitan so I'm going to zoom in so you could see the printing and I should point out the background is all silver so it's a really beautiful uh, impression Now, uh, 
moving away from uh, mogas, and we've seen several mogas, and and so uh, and they were, they've been fantastic. But I want to also highlight other representations of the female form that Sosaku Hanga artists produced. And um, this artist, his name is Hirakawa, and he produced a handful of really interesting designs. He was not very prolific, but um, the work that he did produce, I I find really compelling. And um, I happen to have two works that are very different. And uh, the first work showcases a, a, a woman playing an instrument, a shimasen, and um, and she's on stage with a couple candles. And then we have these figures, mostly men, these men dressed in Western clothing. This gentleman's wearing a fedora. And they're looking at her and she's playing. She's not very happy, but you could see that she has a very long neck. And this is kind of an interesting composition because it's highlighting an actual show that would occur um, in Japan, typically in the countryside or outside of Tokyo. But it was, I, I mean, it was in essence a freak show. And this woman uh, had a very long neck and played this musical instrument, and that was her her show. So I, it, I just think it's fascinating um, to sort of see a design that... <laughs> We've seen some very beautiful designs of beautiful women. And in this case, it's very playful. The way that the print has been um, carved out is very expressive in that Sosaku Hanga-esque quality. And there's a, a, a printing that I also see kind of more Onchi-esque. There's a lot of pigment over pigment, and it's very expressive. But the subject is, is kind of, uh, it's very rare to see something like this in, in printed form. And, um, and I think it's delightful, it's fascinating, and, and it's one of those uh, designs that you just, you come across and go, hmm. <laughs> so anyway, I thought I'd show this, and I think it pairs really well with this design. This is uh, his more, um, it's probably his most celebrated work. It's quite rare, but all, both of these are extraordinarily rare. I've only seen three impressions in 25 years of this design, and I've never seen this design before. That's how rare. And this print is titled uh, Fleur de Mont after the po book of poems by Baudelaire, or The Flower of Evil. And it showcases a woman getting ready. And of course, we've seen this motif before. On we saw those two, that pair of Onchi prints of the same subject, but here, Instead of obscuring the, the view like Onchi did, he very much uh, focuses on the subject, the woman getting ready um, for the, the, the evening's um, escapades. Uh, it has that feeling, at least. And she may, she may be a geisha or an entertainer. Um, it, it has that quality, that vibe. But the way that he depicts her he, he sort of makes her nose quite large. Her eyes have this like kind of almost spiral effect that have an intensity to it. Her eyes are a little bit closer. Um, and so it creates a, kind of a tension of sorts um, with her face. Um, her, her face is elongated and her features are really close. Um, and they may not be overly accentuated, but because they're so close, there's sort of a tension um, within the composition. And so I wouldn't call her conventionally beautiful. In fact, that's intentional. It's intentional to convey this sense of maybe a foreboding or a very, there, there's something that foreshadows, you know, something to come that may not be so delightful. And of course, the title tells us that, uh, Fleur de Mal. So it is a very powerful design. And I, I just wanna show how well um, it's printed. It's done in, in a way where it's really expressive. And again, you know, we, we have uh, Onchi to thank um, for contributing this sort of style to, to printmaking. 
it, it, um, the pigments almost bleed through into the paper, almost as if you might imagine blood bleeding through, especially this particular uh, bright red motif that's printed over the, the lighter reddish orange color. So uh, I think it's a stunning design and it certainly showcases the female form in a very different way than we've encountered before. Both of these. So uh, this is yet another Onchi work that's very, very important. A conversation about 20th cent century female figures can't be um, had without mentioning Onchi's portrait of Sua. It's one of his most important designs. It's an important 20th century um, portrait. And the, as the story goes, Onchi was invited to witness a concert on a American base and um, so he went, he was invited there by William Harnett, who was in charge of, uh, of creating these, um, sort of the programming for the base. And it was all like important cultural sort of like exchanges be between the Japanese and the Americans. And so the Americans invited Sua, who was a very important violinist of the time, um, to perform. And Onchi attended the concert and he was really moved by how he described the very profoundly sad notes of the of the violin in the space of an occupying force it, it was very moving uh, for him and so in this impression we have this is the the let's see one two, this is the third state of the print the first state which exists in one um, impression has a yellow going across the face and the back and then one of the of the these swashes of like black is gray the second state they're both the these two lines are black but there's still some yellow on the face this is the third state there's no yellow that's gone but the face is done in such a wonderful way where there's all this gray which gives a really wonderful emotional impact um the the gray is very subtle but it's there and it's also interesting where how he printed this top portion. It's gray. There's nothing else there. But he printed it with, with a force. You could almost see his fingers uh, printing the back of the, uh, the print onto the, the gray pigment. And you could see the, that movement, which accentuates and echoes the movement of, of the bow going across the violin. This impression is fantastic. And I also want to sort of highlight, here's a program, an original program, from a concert that Sua performed in 1948. Uh, the print is dated 46, because it's a very, very early impression. You, you see this design actually listed as a 1947 design, but it's actually 46. And, um, and this is just a couple years later. I, I show this because it gives you an understanding of her hair. I, I didn't really understand it when I first saw this print, uh, but then you could kind of see her uh, her hair. She has this um, uh, bouffant uh, happening at the at the top here, and it's better articulated in the photo. But anyway, uh, I just wanted to showcase this. And and again, this is an example where uh, a twentieth century uh, bijinga, though this is not what I would consider a traditional bijinga uh, of an image of a beautiful woman a woman but it is a 20th century portrait of a woman um, and very much in the onchi um, manner very expressionistic and and emotional now i also i want to highlight another artist who worked in kansai his name is kawanishi hide kawanishi and um you know, it's interesting. This work is from 1931. So she has a shorter hair. She's a mocha. And this is done in, you know, in a riot of bright reds and yellows. Very Matisse-like. We, we spoke about Hazama working with Matisse. But this is more Matisse than Hazama. And um, 
so, but anyway, um, I wanted to highlight this because it is a celebration of the female form in Kawanishi's sort of signature style with these bright reds and yellows. He was well known for primary colors. I mean, that, that's, that's what he's known for. But I wanted to contrast this with another work that is more subdued. And this was done in 1940. So this is about, this work is about nine or 10 years after this work. And, and this was done at the time when Japan was very actively engaged in the war. And it's funny because um, I, th I think I'm, I'm kind of quoting uh, Lawrence Smith from one of his books uh, that highlights this design from the British Museum's collection. And Lawrence Smith was the uh, keeper of the Japanese prints there. Uh, I think he may still be the emeritus keeper. Um, uh, but anyway, um, my apologies, Mr. Smith, if I didn't, I, I didn't get that correct. But um, he highlights this design in, in a sense that he describes this as more contemplative. And he has, he describes the figure as looking inward. The figure is turned, um, looking away from the viewer, looking towards a Japanese style garden and sort of caught in, in a moment of contempla a, a moment of, 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 um, of th thoughts and, um, and she's taking it all in. And um, in this case, I think it's interesting because I think he has it right. Um, this is a very contemplative design. And, um, and the figure is certainly not engaged with the viewer. And I guess it's Kawanishi's way of sort of conveying um, sort of what was happening with the emotional sort of climate of the time. You know, 1940s Japan was not an easy time for the Japanese, and so, especially if you're an artist who was very much interested in cosmopolitan concerns, he was from Kobe, and there was all these foreigners constantly coming in and out of that city. And Kawanishi really enjoyed that the the culture of other of other uh, the cultures of other world cultures. And when Japan engaged in 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 the war, obviously that was um, curtailed. And so Kawanishi is pretty much sort of maybe suggesting. Um, that the female form is, in fact, the 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 body of the of the populace, and they the, the and th they're reflecting on what it is to be Japanese, looking at a Japanese garden. Maybe that's a little bit more my interpretation, maybe more than what the artist would suggest. But I I find it fascinating to think of it in that way. All right, let's move on. So quickly, um, this is one of the more famous uh, Sosaku Hanga portraits um, of a beautiful woman. This is by Hashimoto. He was uh, very famous for his views of castles, but this is a design he produced that uh, is quite well known. And I won't go too uh, in depth um, on this design because m many of you are familiar with it, but I wanted to showcase a very rare, possibly unique impression of, of the flowers being a different state. And this is a stencil and he colored this possibly by hand. And when, when the artist was trying to figure out how to, how to produce the design, this is, this is one of the variants that he produced. And it actually matches with one of the original drawings that he made of this design that happens to be at the Honolulu Academy of Arts. So this may very well be one of the first impressions of the design, but this is the, the, the version that the artists settled on and, and of course even became famous um, for producing. So I just wanted to showcase these two. All right, moving on. There's still quite a few things to see. And for those of you who have joined, just joined us, I encourage all of you to watch the very beginning because there's a lot of wonderful works that we've discussed that um, will add to the conversation. Um, this work is by a artist who is mostly known for his landscapes. His name is Yamaguchi, Susumu Yamaguchi. And this is one of only a couple of uh, portraits he produced. 
And this is a partially nude woman sitting with a, um, an arrangement of flowers. It's very sort of posed and very delicate and very much kind of a Western subject. But I find it interesting because he is a landscape artist. And I think he approached this portrait much like he would have uh, his landscapes. He, the coloration of the woman's skin is not, it's not what you would imagine to find. It's a brownish, earthy tone. It, it, very much reminiscent of some of his landscapes. And so I kind of see her fleshy brown uh, tone of her skin as a landscape of sorts. And of course, he includes the flowers here. And, you know, the way that this cloth is draped, that echoes a lot of his landscapes and the hills of his landscapes. And so I just think it's fascinating when an artist, particularly a Japanese artist, who's most known for his landscapes, does attempt at produce, uh, producing a, a, a portrait, a bijinga, but, you know, he, he can't forget what he's done before and what he will continue to do. So it's a really interesting conversation um, in this composition. And the background here is this rich blue that is reminiscent of his night uh, scenes. He, this is the same blue you, you see in his landscapes. Um, and so it's fascinating that all of these elements are found in his landscapes, but he's able to produce a really compelling, stunning um, portrait. That work is from the 50s, late 40s, early 50s. It's not dated, um, but based on the style. Now, this is one of the works I featured in the promotion of the prints, or, or of this uh, talk. And it's from 1952 by the artist Kitaoka Fumio. And this is a portrait of his wife. And I think it's fascinating. It, it's, it, the title is a, a face, but it is a, a portrait of his wife. And this design is just so stunning and powerful. It highlights um, sort of his, there's all these lines going across. It, it's almost done in, in a, a style that you would recall in futurism um, that was uh, sort of popular in the, in, in the, in the 20s and even earlier um, in Italy and other parts of Europe. But in this case, this, this, this composition is done much later in the 50s. And, and so I think he has borrowed that quality of the lines from futurism but now he's translated those lines as almost as if they're 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 recording uh, sort of his 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 gestures as he's carving the blocks and so the way that i read this is it's is more about the artist at work producing the design and how this design sort of comes into focus in the viewer's eye in the way that the artist was producing the design. So I hope that makes sense. But yeah, I, I think it's very powerful and very active. Um, the color is this really wonderful, brilliant red. And the, the shading around the lines, the bokashi, accentuate the movement of those lines. So I, I just think it's a fascinating um, yeah, composition. Yeah, and, and you know, I'm looking at the comments. Uh, thanks, Richard. It does look like a watercolor. Absolutely. A lot of these prints have that quality um, where the, the, the amount of pigment that's applied and how loose it's applied, it, 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 they almost look as if they're painted or, 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 if, or they're watercolors. But obviously, these are all woodblock printed. And, you know, just because I can, I'll show you the bleed through. You can look at the back of the print. And the back of the print is as interesting as the front. All right, all right, let's continue. We're almost done. So for those of you who joined me at the very start of almost an hour and a half ago, congratulations. Thank you for staying with me so long. So um, I want to sort of show a couple more very rare works by artists who, who just don't you don't really see and this artist is Kozuo Takeda or Takeda is his last name Takeda Kazumo or Kazuo sorry um, and um, I wanted to show 
two works by him. One isn't a Bijinga. This is, of course. It's a portrait of a woman, and she actually happens to be a factory worker. And it's interesting how Takeda uh, sort of produces his beauty because her head is quite small. It almost seems like she's this mountain and the top is so remote. But what we do see here closest to the viewer is her hands. And they're exaggerated and they're, and they're very large and, and, and very strong looking. And of course, the shadow of, of, of that's on her blouse, um, it's echoing sort of, you can almost imagine um, that the room she's in is filled with a, a, a fire. Maybe a factory where, where people are shoveling coal into the fire. And there's a warmth in, in the way the light is presented. But it also is kind of jagged. And it really highlights um, and celebrates the working class in Japanese factories. And the people who really are involved in helping industry grow. Particularly in post-war Japan. This was done after the war. And at a time when the reconstruction of Japan was very much um, you know, on, underway. And so this, this design celebrates one of those workers. Now, just to give this design context, here's a design of two workers. One carrying this empty um, sort of barrel uh, you know, where, where you, would, you imagine a big grouping of coal would be in this wheelbarrow is just being is being carried by the worker he's probably going to go somewhere to fill it up and then we have the silhouette of another one with a shovel and they're shoveling coal and the yellow the fire basically is the entire background of this composition and so i read this work very much in conversation with his other work done at the exact same time this literally could have been done the same day uh, the colors are the same, the feels the same, but in this composition, it really celebrates uh, a woman of the working class who was very much involved in in hard labor, and the what is uh, evidence of that is her, the artist decided to uh, accentuate her her hands. It re she really does look like someone that could um, do the labor, and this work is not forties, probably late forties, early fifties. So thanks for the question, Richard. And so, yeah, this this work is about the people who were working in the factories who were laboring to basically rebuild Japan. And so that that's what was uh, happening. And this design really showcases that. And I should mention that Takeda is a self-taught artist. So you could see his prints aren't perfect. You could see the white around this figure. Um, the white around the certain aspects of the composition. And that's just misalignment of the registration. But I think it works for his compositions. They're very, they, they have this sort of self-taught naive quality to them, uh, but are also very powerful. And he was once one of those workers. So he saw this, this was in his life and was producing prints that reflected, um, you know, his experience. We're getting towards the end, and I wanted to showcase a uh, work by Kiyoshi Saito, and he was a very important um, 20th century print artist that w basically became well known after the Americans um, were in, in, in uh, post-war occupied Japan. And this design is a mono print, so it showcases uh, a bijinga, or an image of a beautiful woman, but in a, in, a, in a very early Saito-esque manner. What Saito did is he was influenced by sort of the Nabi in this case. So you, you could see the work of Vallard or Bernard in this design. And, and it's a monoprint. So it is entirely done in one um, go. And so it was just this one print that was produced from his efforts. So, you know, I, I wanted to highlight this because Saito monoprints are so rare, but it also showcases, um, you know, his interest in Western art that um, certainly contributed to his body of work. Um, I mean, I, I could have showed you a bunch of his other things, but I think 
um, at this point in our conversation, it would be nice to see something we may not have seen before. And I thought it would be interesting to sh present this work. This is a Western artist, an American, who was in occupied uh, Japan. He was part of the American forces who became friends with Saito. His name was, was Ray Cato. And what happened was he, he met Saito, became very interested in his work, and then became interested in woodblock printing himself. And he worked under Saito. Saito taught him the uh, process. And, um, you know, he made prints here. Um, he made this design, Girl from the Tea House. And the August Moon, it's, it's numbered one out of 20. And so this was done, obviously, late 40s, early 50s. And um, it, it has a very strong Saito-esque quality to it. So you could see that the artist really was influenced by his teacher. Uh, but at the same time, it, it, it has its own qualities to it. And it showcases how, Western, uh, how Japanese artists were exporting the ideas, these, these themes in Japanese prints to the West. And here, and directly to a Westerner who picked them up and started producing work himself. He he was a well. I he I mean, he wasn't an amazing artist who went on and produced a large body of work. He did, you know, several, and I would say maybe a dozen designs or so. And I've seen them come up for sale every so often, and they all look like Saito's. So it's interesting to see this connection and the influence that a. Japanese artist made on a Western artist. All right, we're nearing the end. So this is a work um, that is a little bit of a puzzle to me. Um, the artist's name is Fukui, and um, you know, he's a fascinating artist because he only, he, he started making prints, um, you know, after the war, but he then focused on, on painting. So in terms of his printed material, he may have made about 30 or 40 designs, and then the rest are, are oil on canvas. And his prints are actually not woodblock printed. They're mimeographs. And so... For those of you who recall being back in school, like I do, and this was in the 80s, I was, you know, we were given dittos from a ditto machine, and that is the process and how this print was made. Now, this is a very elaborate design, and in my understanding of mimeograph machines is very elementary, so I can't really go into the particular details in how this print was produced but I will say that it was produced in a way that he could make about a dozen or so prints at the most so the process did not lend itself to making like 50 or 100 and in in the additions of his prints are typically under 10 but I've seen them in in additions of 20 and 30 as well but in this case, this is probably one of maybe two or three that are known um, in existence. And his style is really fascinating. I, I, I almost kind of, when I look at this, it's, it's one of those designs where you kind of see that Japanese interest in, um, in cuteness. And, um, but also um, an interest in Western art. I almost, I dare say that I see a connection to almost medieval painting and, it, and it's a fascinating work and the the detail and the the amount of labor he put into this to get the textures uh, varying on the on the surface of the print is just fascinating and um, it's a very rare wor work I've never seen this work in person before it is listed in the artist catalog raisonne um, in uh, you know as I said there may be somewhere between two to five impressions of this print um, in existence. But um, I wanted to share this with everyone because it's such a rare work. And we have a post-war um, artist that's interested in reproducing Bijinga, at least early on. He went on to just focus on still lives in his prints. 
Um, and then he did do a series of paintings of beautiful women. But in this case, this is one of only a couple um, Bijinga of his body of printed work. Yeah, it's a fascinating design. Here, I'll show you the back because in woodblock prints, you always see a sort of a bleed through. And here, you don't really see a bleed through. This is more of a chemical reaction with the paper, which is fascinating, but you don't see a bleed through at all with the pigments. The pigments rest solely on the surface of, of, of the paper. So I, th I think uh, because of that, it's fascinating. All right. I think we have two last prints. So I, I saved these l larger size prints for, for last because there's just, there's just so big. And this is by uh, Sakino. And this, this work, um, uh, Sakino, his, his first name is Junichiro. And this work was done in 1940 when the artist uh, first sort of arrived in Tokyo. I think he arrived in 1939. He enrolled into a, a, a school of painting and was studying um, Western style yoga painting. And in this case here, uh, Sakino is fascinated by the Western subject of the nude, uh, but he, he puts his nude in, in a more traditional Japanese um, sort of perspective. Again, we have this really interesting um, door or, or, or this is a wooden door. You could, you could see the handle here where you could slide the wooden door open or closed. And in this case, this is reminiscent, of, again, of the Onshi print um, with something obscuring um, the design where he has a, a screen um, that is partially obscuring the composition. The Hirakawa had a little bit of that element, but not completely. And in this case, he showcases the, the sliding door and he highlights it in, in such amazing detail. This is not the wood grain of a block. This is, this is actually a wood carved um, pattern that he made onto the block that was used to print this design. I would imagine he used plywood for this large composition. I mean, this is, this is huge. And um, I mean, you could literally put about six Oban size prints onto the surface of this, uh, this print. And so this was carved by hand and printed, um, but it mimics the wood grain of the door. It also sort of mimics the wood grain of Edo period prints uh, of Hiroshige and Hokusai, particularly Hiroshige. But, but this, is, this is not printed just with a plank of wood. It is in fact carved. And then we have here a stunning nude. Um, and then we have sort of a, a day bed here and with a window. And these, these colors are really bright. They're almost fauvist in quality. And I mean, here, Sakino is interested in experimenting in a style that is very Western, but he incorporates um, Japanese motifs within the composition and also uh, also, the, 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 the perspective is a combination of both Western as well as Japanese. And so it's a fascinating interplay uh, visually of two traditions. And, um, and the size of this is just is astonishing. It's one of Sakino's earliest works. And he was inspired by his, his, particularly the studies that he was undergoing at that time. And, how, and he basically moved from oil on canvas onto the wood black on paper. And so this size is a direct um, influence of his interest in painting. Sorry, I'm having a little bit of difficulty with my um, connection. So if you, I lose you, um, I'm not going to disappear. But this is our last work. Let me see if I can open this. This is a work by Oki Hashimoto. This was done in 1952. It's quite large, about the size of the, the Sakino work. So imagine about six Oban size prints. Um, that is quite large. And we've seen uh, a pair of Oki Hashimoto's before. Uh, Hashimoto, for those of you 
who don't know, and as I mentioned, was an artist interested in castles. And most, I would say about 95% of his body of work are, depict castles and landscapes. But he did do some some beauties or bijinga, and these de- this design is just fantastic. It's these two nudes that are in a field with goats. So it's very playful, and the carving is very, very active. And it's interesting because the figures look Western to me, but they're a little bit of a mix of Japanese and, 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 and Western. Uh, but the, the, the point I want to make on this composition is that it always reminds me that Hashimoto reproduced Yamamoto Kanai's fishermen um, after, I would say, was it in the 50s? He reproduced his fishermen. Um, it was the very first work of, of Sosaku Hanga. And so because Yamamoto, um, be, be, I'm sorry, Yamamoto, ha- Hashimoto reproduced the design. And, and I think because Hashimoto reproduced the design, he was also interested in producing work that was very expressive in the carving. And this, this background really reminds me of um, Yamamoto's work, particularly his wood engraving. Um, and so it, this is a fascinating study of two nudes in a field that is really active and very expressive. So I'm just gonna zoom in so you could see this work and how stunning it is. So I think that does it in terms of the work I want to show. I want to fi- finish up our conversation, as I always do, with um, a conversation of books that are available. There, there is a book that I highly recommend for Shinhanga images of Bijinga or beautiful uh, uh, images of beautiful women. This, the, the female image is one of the more important books that I re- would recommend. Now for Sosaku Hanga, uh, this is a good survey of both uh, Shin Hanga and Sosaku Hanga, but there's a good examination of Sosaku Hanga prints that we discussed today in this, in this exhibition catalog, Waves of Renewal, Modern Japanese Prints from 1900 to 1960. Um, also, this book, Modern Japanese Prints by Oliver Statler, uh, outlines the, the tradition of, of Sosaku Hanga. Highly recommend that book. This exhibition catalog, Hanga Japanese Creative Prints, is an excellent book. Um, that's an exhibition catalog for an exhibition that occurred in the gallery in New South Wales. The, the exhibition catalog highlights Onchi as well as all of the early Sosaku Hanga artists. This book by Lawrence Smith is also excellent, uh, highlights prints of Sosaku Hanga artists that, that were produced um, during the Allied occupation, and, and as, as well as the you know the latter part of the of the movement. And lastly, but not least, this is actually one of the best catalogs on the on the topic, in in the sense that it overviews the entire movement of Bijinga in 20th century Japan. It doesn't. My my contention. I mean, I, I, I'm annoyed by this because most exhibitions that feature Bijinga of 20th century prints always ignore Sosaku Hanga. And they always focus on Goyo. This is a Goyo print. Um, and they focus on you know artists like Katando, Shinsui, Goyo, and so on. But they don't really handle the, uh, the topic of Sosaku Hanga. It's, it's as almost as if um, Sosaku Hanga didn't exist in, and didn't produce great... Uh, Bijinga. And so this exhibition catalog highlights um, designs by both Shinhanga and Sosaku Hanga artists. Now, the images aren't great. There's some that are in color at the beginning, but, but most of them are in black and white. But the point is, this is a really great overview of, of just 20th century Bijinga. It was produced for the Ricard Art Museum's 1982 exhibition of the subject. So it's quite old and not easy to find. But I want to thank all of you 
particular ones who've, who've been with me from the very beginning, we've almost hit the two hour mark. We're uh, an hour and 48 minutes from, from well, from uh, being on to two hours. So I want to thank all of you for joining me. Um, it's been a pleasure to offer you a presentation that highlights some of the more important Sosaku Hanga designs, as well as rare works. And I want to finish our conversation with just pointing out a few things about the movement. Um, I, I typically think that Sosaku Hanga uh, prints in general, and, and Bijinga in particular, aren't highlighted enough because of the rarity of these works. These artists were producing prints for themselves and for a smaller market. And um, because they were doing that, they were able to engage with their own feelings, with their own creative pursuits, and produced highly expressive and important designs that highlight important aspects of the 20th century experience in Japan. However, because of that, they weren't as commercial in, in, in terms of how they looked as well as how they were distributed. And so because of that, there, there's just not enough material out in the world um, to produce exhibitions like this. And so this is one of the reasons why I feel so um, obligated in, in, in a really wonder, in a joyful way. I mean, it's a, it's a joy to present all of this with, to all of you. But, um, so there aren't that many resources online or books that you can find that sort of create this type of conversation. So this, uh, I'm hoping this is the first of many, many more conversations, um, and not just conversations I will have, but other, others will have, other curators and other institutions that have some work that could create greater exhibitions on this topic and other topics on Sosaku Hanga. At least that's my hope. So I want to thank all of you for joining me. Uh, and it's been, as I said, a pleasure to present all of this material um, to all of you. And if you have any questions on anything, uh, particularly people who are joining us on YouTube much later, feel free to ask the questions um, below the in the comments of the video, and I'll be happy to field any of your questions, even if it's years from now. So let's say it's 2028 20, and you're watching this video, ask those questions. I will, I will respond to them. And uh, so uh, thank you all of you for joining me. And uh, again, I'm Elias Martin from CollectingJapanesePrints.com. If you haven't visited my website, I encourage you to check it out. It's uh, an amazing assortment of prints right now. Um, and of course, there's a lot of free content on my site as well. It's not just commercial. It's, it's a joy to share all of this information and, and these prints with all of you. And uh, so you know, there's my Woodblock Wednesday vlogs all archived on my site, as well as other uh, presentations I've given in the past. So thank you all of you for joining me. I hope to see you again very, very soon. Until then, thank you.